be the month of the meeting with the Great Native Society of Sri Lanka. Uh, and uh, for today's uh, event, we have uh, three eminent uh, speakers. And the first, uh, I, let me first uh, introduce the, uh, the first speaker, uh, Dr. Prabodhana Ranavira. He's a senior lecturer in optics and gynecology at the Faculty of Medicine University of Colombo. He will be uh, delivering his lecture on prevention of preterm labor. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Chairperson, sir, Dr. Kalmaratna. Uh, so, today I'm going to uh, talk to you about uh, prevention of preterm labor. I'm going to, I'm going to discuss about the uh, Risk specification as well as uh, the strategies available for uh, prevent treatment. Now, delivery before uh, 37 weeks of gestation is considered as uh, preterm birth, and uh, the global incidence is about 10.3 percent and it's increasing. Uh, the Sri Lankan uh, statistics uh, is uh, more or less similar, with uh, 10 percent contributing uh, to the preterm birth. It's the leading cause of neonatal mortality and morbidity, accounting for 75% of the neonatal mortality worldwide. Two thirds of the uh, preterm birth occur spontaneously, that is due to uh, preterm labor or preterm premature rupture of membranes. And one third is due to therapeutic uh, need for delivery, either severe preeclampsia or, or severe fetal growth restriction, any condition that as a therapeutic measure, either to save the baby or to mother, where we uh, deliver prematurely. It has uh, a lot of health implication for the mother as well as the fetus. And also it has a, a big burden to the financial uh, status, especially for the health budget uh, to uh, maintain and care for these premature babies. So prevention of preterm birth is one of the main goals in objectives. Uh, it's always uh, better to have some insight about the, the pathophysiology, what is the cause for preterm labor. Now, traditionally, it is thought that uh, cervical dysfunction, which leads to uh, intrauterine infection, with the sending infection, which causes the chorionitis uh, and uh, uh, fetal infection, as well as which uh, increase the inflammation in, and uh, subsequently end up with either pre, um, pre labor rupture of membrane or preterm labor. However, with the new understanding, it is thought that uh, placental insufficiency contributes significantly towards the, uh, the onset of preterm labor. Now, uh, there are a lot of studies which have shed light to uh, this theory. And it has, in fact, is proven that uh, when it's after 30 weeks, the, the leading cause for preterm labor is actually placental insufficiency and the intrauterine uh, infection uh, is reducing. So um, now when it comes to, so you have to think about uh, preterm labor as a multifactorial etiology. It may be due to cervical incompetence, it may be due to uh, placental insufficiency, or it may be a, a combination of both. And uh, in, in fact, it has been thought that when there is uh, mild placental insufficiency, where it is not has gone uh, to a place where it has caused preeclampsia or due to growth restriction, which will contribute to preterm labor. So I'm going to uh, the the main strategy for preventing of uh, preterm labor is to screening of the high risk uh, pregnancies, which might end up in uh, preterm labor. Now, however, like let's say if there's a medicine or some intervention we found that to prevent all women who had a previous preterm labor uh, uh, to prevent a subsequent occurrence, but still its contribution to the perinatal mortality would be minimal because. Most of the time, it happens in patients who are deemed to be low risk. However, uh, from over the many years, there have been many um, studies and interventions which has aimed to prevent uh, patients who are considered as high risk to prevent preterm labor. So, these 
uh, risk factors can be categorized into uh, uh, like maternal risk factors, like ethnicity, so that the Caucasian has a low risk of preterm labor, whereas uh, uh, low body mass index, smoking, maternal uh, dental disease, uh, uplan abnormalities, high excisional surgeries in the cervix, the previous curatage and previous preterm labor uh, birth, uh, and in the current pregnancy, pregnancy interval and multiple case failure. So because of the time frame, I will stick to one of the few which has, uh, has a significant contribution. So out of all these risk factors, previous preterm birth is the, the, the most predictive one. It increases three to four fold increase of a subsequent preterm labor. And earlier the preterm labor occurred, the, the higher the risk for the in a subsequent pregnancy. And higher the number of uh, previous preterm births will increase the risk as well. Also, in multiple guest patients, twins or high order pregnancies has a high risk of preterm labor. Now, in one study, it has shown that 50%, almost 60% of uh, the, the pregnancy was delivered before 37 weeks and 11% of that was in extreme prematurity. Low birth, uh, low BMI, less than 17 kilograms, also considers as a high risk factor, which increases the risk by two times. And it is thought that uh, the malnutrition or the lack of micronutrients is the cause for the preterm labor, whereas a high BMI, also considered as a high risk factor. Now, their theory in that consent is they think that the inflammatory markers are high in an obese woman, which leads to uh, preterm labor. Uterine anomalies like uh, uh, biconutritus, septae, and uh, didelphidus, and things like that also contribute significantly for preterm labor. Also, uh, as I told you earlier, when you look at the etiology, as I told you, placental insufficiency also cause increased risk of preterm labor. Somebody who's having a previous history of preeclampsia, placental pathology, if available, will shed some light. If they look at the placental uh, side, the pathologist will uh, kind of um, they, uh, report it as having um, high risk of infection, which Whereas if they have high maturity, the, the vessel shows that there are a lack of uh, remodeling, that more uh, the preterm labor may be due to placental insufficiency. And there are, uh, so any of these women who are having these kind of risk factors, we consider them to be high risk. And also during pregnancy, we can do certain things to find patients who may have an increased risk of preterm labor. So cervical length plays a key role. Now in a landmark study done in 1996, where they did a multi-center study in, in both risk, high-risk women as well as low-risk women, and they measured the cervix and they found that the 20, less than 25 uh, millimeters, which is considered, considered as the 10th percentile, they have a higher, uh, before 24 week of gestation as an increased risk of uh, preterm labor. Uh, the more important thing for obstetricians is like to when you measure the cervical length, the less than 25, even a patient who's going to have a cervix less than four, uh, 25 millimeters, it rarely occurs before 14 weeks because most of us are used to do this screening at 12 weeks. However, it's uh, now recommend that you should do a screening at 16 weeks if you are to find this out. And the transvaginal method should be used because it is more accurate and the transabdominal uh, cervical measurement has shown to be inaccurate. So uh, when you look at the risk stratification, so they, we categorize women into four categories. Women with a single term pregnancy without so in essentially low risk women. If their cervical length is uh, 25 millimeters, uh, interestingly, they have a, they are the positive predictive value. That is, they end up having a, a preterm labor is less, only 18% uh, in a woman who didn't have a previous preterm labor. However, there is a movement towards universal screening, screening all women at around 16 weeks or 18 weeks, especially at the anatomical scan, where we call the anomaly scan, to see whether they have a high risk of preterm labor. Uh, 
women with uterine anomalies or high excision surgery like uh, cervical what you call cone biopsies or lets uh, if they have a cervical length less than 25 millimeters they are eight times higher uh, to have a preterm labor during in, in that pregnancy so screening them is recommended so in a history where something we have to do a trans cervical scan uh, woman with multiple gestation without previous preterm labor who's just having twins without previous history and studies a uh, meta-analysis shown that if they are uh, have a less than 25 millimeters they have a likelihood ratio of more than 9.6 uh, to have a uh, birth before 28 weeks so serial cervical length assessment is recommended in twin pregnancies we serially go and see whether there is a shortening of the cervix. Uh, and the main, uh, you know, the risk factor, which is previous preterm labor, if they have a, a cervical length of less than 25 millimeters, it's highly predictive. So we not only screen them once, we do it serially in a patient who had a previous uh, preterm labor to see whether we need to do any interventions. Uh, the other thing we can do during uh, pregnancy is screening for uh, bacterial vaginosis. And it's, uh, as you all know, it's abnormal vaginal uh, flora, mainly due to Gardenella and uh, you know, bacterial species and microplasma, and which replace the, the, what we call the normal vaginal flora of uh, lactobacillus. And in a woman who have a, a confirmed bacterial vaginosis has a two-fold increase of preterm labor. However, giving medicine universally or uh, treating all women with antibiotics has not shown to reduce preterm labor. So there is no evidence for universal screening. However, uh, screening for women who had a previous preterm labor with uh, vaginal uh, swabs with a Newton score will and treatment with clindamycin has shown to reduce the chance of preterm labor in a high risk population. Uh, fibronectin, it's not available in Sri Lanka, and uh, but there have been many studies because uh, the fibronectin is uh, negative. It has a high more than is 99%. So we can safely send them home. However, when it's positive, it's not associated with either preterm labor uh, because only 30%. Right? So because of their low predictive value, and of course it's very costly, because of that, it has not shown to, and also in all these category of women, it has not shown to prove any benefit, even in women who had a previous preterm labor. So at the moment, it's not used for screening in, a, uh, in patients. Right, so one of the, the main strategies that we use as obstetrician to prevent preterm labor is giving progesterone. So uh, we know progesterone uh, has a role in maintaining the pregnancy, especially in the first trimester, where the corpus luteum secrete uh, uh, progesterone, which keeps the, uh, the uh, reduce the chance of miscarriages. And uh, also we have shown that when we have mifepristone, like a progesterone antagonist, when we give that, they have they shown muscular. Now, when you categorize the women, let's say women who with a single ten pregnancy without previous preterm labor, by giving universally everybody, uh, somebody who's coming with a pregnancy giving progesterone has not shown any benefit. However, in women who has a previous preterm, uh, without a previous preterm labor, but when we do the cervical screening, we found that their uh, cervix is less than 25 millimeters. By giving progesterone, there had been uh, evidence that it reduces the chance of preterm labor. So, uh, so that is where one place where it is recommended in a low risk population where we found that their cervical length is less. Uh, women with multiple pregnancy without previous term labor. Now that is a controversial issue because the studies have, some studies have shown that by giving progesterone to multiple pregnancies or twins or high order pregnancies, it reduced preterm labor. And some have shown that when there's a short cervix, by giving progesterone compared to a placebo group, they have a less risk of having a preterm labor. Now, uh, at the moment, it's a controversial thing. So some 
obstetricians give, some obstetricians doesn't, especially uh, when it comes to IVF, most of the patients are on progesterone, when uh, despite uh, you know evidence uh, otherwise. Now, women with previous preterm labor, that is an interesting topic because in 2003, when uh, Mace did the study in a multi center study, she found that uh, the, by giving uh, progesterone for women with previous preterm labor, reduced the uh, chance of preterm labor significantly. And later, there have been two large studies, one of two landmark studies. One thing, one is called the optimum study, the other one is the progress study. And both of these studies failed to show any benefit. There was no difference between the placebo group as well as the interventional group. But when they do a, the Cochrane review, they found that there is some benefit. And even in the optimum study, in certain subgroups of patients has shown that by giving, especially the ones who had a previous preterm labor and a cervical length less than meters, has shown there is benefit. So at the moment, it's recommended for clinical use. Now I'll come back to why there had been so much difference in the the, the, the research, uh, research findings, but uh, let's uh, still move on about the strategies. And another strategy that we use commonly is a circlage, which is a surgical intervention where we put a, a, a stitch to the neck of the womb. It's because it's a surgery, it's associated with risk, especially bleeding, and there's a chance of uh, miscarriage, which is considered as 1%. Right. And at the moment, uh, there are several techniques. One is called the Shirotka and one is called the McDonald's. And uh, the Shirotka technique, which is uh, the circlage is uh, put in a higher place, close to the, uh, the bladder neck, is considered superior to McDonald's suture technique. And also, when both of these measures fail, fails, abdominal circlage, is also considered beneficial in a minority of patients. But the, the main drawback in the abdominal circlage is if the patient goes into labor, the patient should have a cesarean section or a hysterotomy to deliver because uh, the patient cannot deliver vaginally because of the stitch. So we consider, we keep it for very special patients where everything else has failed. Right, so let's uh, see what happens uh, if you put the circlage in this high, uh, the three categories of in The cervix chart shows to uh, shorten, we tend to put a circlage, but again, studies have failed to show any benefit for putting a circlage, even when the cervix is short, less than 25%, 25 millimeters, in a patient who uh, does not have a previous history of preterm labor. And women with a multiple pregnancy without previous, that is uh, twins or high order women, without a history of previous preterm labor. Now putting a circlage in this group of uh, patients has shown to be harmful. Sometimes when we put a circlage, they tend to, or one study has shown that that increase the risk of preterm labor. However, when the cervical length is less than 15 millimeters, which is the fifth centile, it has shown some benefit. So at the moment we receive putting a circlage in twins to patients where the cervix is very short. Right, now it comes for the main high risk category, which is the previous women with a previous history of preterm labor. Traditionally, we had two ways of putting circlage. We call the history indicated and ultrasound indicated. In history indicated means we, when there's a preterm labor, either one or two or even three, we consider without doing any cervical assessment, putting a circlage at 14 weeks of gestation. Because I told you that it's a procedure which has a 1% chance of a miscarriage. So in, in women, though they have a preterm labor, without assessment of the cervix, putting a circlage has shown to be sometimes not beneficial or do more harm than good. However, when it combined with the ultrasound scan, when, a, when there's a short cervix, putting a circlage has shown to be beneficial. 
there was a lot of uh, you know talk about the new vaginal pessaries when it came to the market and with a study called percept in 2012 where they found that uh, uh, putting a, a pessary has reduced the survival uh, preterm labor by 80 percent so it was a big thing because there was no surgery in, involved very easy technique and uh, you know it was it's, it was thought at one point the solution for preterm labor but subsequent studies over the years after 2012 has shown there was no benefit or there was no difference between putting a vaginal pessary or not putting it so at the moment we need more evidence to kind of uh, come to more solid conclusions the the new or the what you call the the, the new technique or new uh, uh, what you call um, a strategy that we are supposed to use is aspirin because i told you now aspirin has shown to reduce the chance of preterm uh, preeclampsia pre uh, fetal growth restriction when it's used in early pregnancy and in fact some of the studies uh, you know from the pre-med uh, what you call uh, uh, there had been uh, uh, many studies of using aspirin in uh, in this high risk category of patient who had previous pre, uh, pre eclampsia and abruption and things like that. And when they analyzed, they found that they had a reduced chance of preterm labor as well. Right? So then uh, there had been a, a big study called Aspirin study, which was published in very recently in uh, Lancet 2020. It showed that there is a significant reduction in preterm labor uh, if we use aspirin from six weeks to 14 weeks and continue until 36 weeks uh, whether uh, this is this is called uh, singleton pregnancy primary only first timers without any history of preterm labor who has high risk of preeclampsia where we are recommended to give aspirin and during that style trial they found that they have a reduced risk for preterm la uh, preterm labor so there is a movement called aspirin for all especially for uh, primary gravidas with the low risk uh, aspirin work in a, pre, uh, a patient in a previous history of preterm labor is also being studied at the moment called the april study but we have to wait till the the, the, the study findings to see whether they also benefit from aspirin so i'm kind of uh, like what i wanted to tell you uh, mainly is the you now one of the key uh, problems when you look at the research pertaining to preterm labor is the they they produce conflicting evidence in some study they show that there is benefit and after they do a study later they found uh, they usually find that it's not beneficial however when you look at each of these studies there's one thing which i saw which is that we usually treat one cause only and we tend to forget because now there we are trying to treat a condition which is multifactorial and we are trying to address only one aspect of it, right? Sometimes giving antibiotics, maybe the patients who are in that group may have more of a placental problem. So uh, the, the more pathophysiological, because none of the studies have divided them looking at their previous history into either uh, a possibility of placental etiology of uh, possibility of uh, what we call uh, uh, cervical insufficiency and then randomizing and see whether progestogen works or aspirin works or other thing has to be done so more pathophysiological approach may be necessary in the future and in the future when we are risk categorizing placental pathology may emerge as a key factor in determining the probability uh, thank you uh, dr Papodena, for this uh, that interpretive uh, presentation uh, our next uh, speaker would be Dr. Nalin Gamatige. Uh, he's a consultant neonatologist at the Soisa Maternity Hospital, Colombo, and he will be talking on immediate management of the preterm. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, Dr. Kaushalya, President, uh, Perinatal Society of Medicine, um, and my dear friends. Um, now, next 20 minutes, I'm going to talk about immediate management of uh, preterm babies. So I would like to start with this slide. The recent FPQ study data shows that uh, one of the success stories in modern medicine has been the increase in survival of very pre 
very premature babies. Uh, if you look at the data uh, in developed countries uh, over the last few decades, uh, their survival has improved dramatically for babies born at 26 weeks and above uh, up to 80 percent. So the EPIQ data is a series of uh, studies uh, on on um, series of studies on uh, preterm survival, which was done some time back between 22 to 26 weeks. Um, so their survival rate is even up to 80 percent. Right? So with this background, if you look at our Sri Lankan data, our annual birth rate, as you all know, it's around like 375,000. Uh, Preterm birth rate is around uh, 10 percent. And our neonatal mod rate is, however, 5.3 per thousand live births according to the recent World Bank report. If you look at the main causes for neonatal deaths in Sri Lanka, so after the congenital anomalies, which, which will account like 40%, the majority, almost like 25%, is due to the prematurely related complication. So therefore, if we can focus on uh, management of preterm baby, we will be definitely we will be able to reduce neonatal mortality rate in this country. Um, so, uh, when it comes to the preterm manage, pre uh, ma immediate management of the preterm infant, you know that when you compare with the term babies, uh, when the preterm babies comes from internal environment to the external environment, their transition is not that smooth. Uh, they are very fragile. They need a lot of support. So, if you can manage this preterm baby diligently and promptly at this stage, the survival rate would be more. So, uh, in next few minutes, I would like to highlight. So, how would you prepare for a preterm delivery, and the importance of delayed cord clamping and the safe recitation and the stabilization, and also the thermoregulations. So, these are the factors that you need to focus when it comes to the preterm management. So, how do you prepare for a preterm delivery? Preparation for a preterm delivery is essential, right? So, when you prepare for a delivery, so you must have a kind of history. Uh, that means the gestational age and the multiple, whether it is multiple pregnancy or not, and other risk factors like premature rupture of membrane, whether the steroids was given and max sulfate was given. And also, uh, you need to communicate with your relevant teams. There are three teams involved in uh, preterm management that is, obstetric team and the neonatal team, and also the transfer team, right? There should be a proper communication between these two, uh, three uh, teams uh, before you deliver the baby. And also at the same time, you need to pre warm the incubators, including the transport to an incubator, as well as the incubators where that you are going to uh, place the baby in a NICU. Um, it is important to increase the uh, humidity in uh, incubators as well. Uh, and also, you need to go to the delivery suite and then check the equipment and ensure delivery room temperature is between 26 to 28. Uh, finally, don't ever forget to talk to the parents you know they are super anxious right so you need to alleviate the, uh, their anxiety right Stop, talk them nicely and confidently and show them that you are you are you are there to look after their babies right if you like talk them confidently they will believe you on you otherwise there are a lot of problems you know they will ask plenty of questions but you know mainly highlight important events and you know what we are going to do that means basically you need to tell them your plan, right? That, that is reassuring, actually, right? So, uh, again, this is part of the preparation, right? So, uh, you know this. Um, you have to have these equipments, you know. You go to the place, switch off, switch off the AC and set the appropriate temperature, close the windows and turn, turn on the heater and make sure the oxygen supply is there. And before you touch the equipment, you need to wash your hands properly and wear double gloves and check the equipment. And once the baby is born, you need to start the clock. And at the same time, you need to remove one pair of gloves that you are still sterile. And you basically deliver the babies into the plastic bags, preterm babies. And you need to cover the head with a hat and assess the baby's condition. At the same time, make sure the placement of pulse oximeter in preterm babies. Now it is recommended. So these are the equipments that um, you know most of the neonatal units or the delivery rooms have. You need to be familiar with what you have got. Most of the time, uh, the doctors and the nurses, they are not familiar with this machine, how to operate in case of uh, 
uh, in case of uh, uh, equipment failure. So therefore, you have to have a proper idea about these machines as well. So these are the equipments, you know, the clock, warm, dry towel, uh, plastic bags, firm uh, surface, gas supply, and the neopuff. I will tell you about these things later on also. And the good layer is layering the scope, you know that piece. And finally, drugs. We rarely use drugs in newborn recitation, but it's better to have adrenaline, dextrose, and volume. And the white bow and scissors and tapes in case you need to, if you want to like um, intubate and ventilate, then of course you have to have these things. So, um, what is uh, safe recitation? Right. What is safe recitation? So, I told you in previous slides. So the management of the preterm baby involves safe recitation. Safe re uh, when it comes to safe recitations, you need to know what are the factors which can damage preterm babies. So these are the factors which can damage preterm baby. That is hyperoxia. If you give too much of oxygen, it will definitely damage the preterm lungs. I told you their lungs are fragile. And also inadequate peep. That is the opening pressure. So if you need, need to set uh, appropriate opening pressure, to keep the lung open and also better to avoid high tidal volumes that is uh, very dangerous keeping high tidal volume and also the avoid hypothermia as much as possible this is a killer so when it comes to oxygen so why i said that oxygen is dangerous for newborn born at birth uh, according to studies you know just before the baby is born if you check the uh, partial pressure of the oxygen of fetus that is around like 27 percent that is very low uh, soon after birth if you check the saturation it could be around like 60. at this point if you give too much of oxygen even if the brief exposure of your newborn to uh, oxygen is detrimental right so they therefore avoid oxygen as much as possible uh, now there are enough studies actually after 10 randomized control trials um, it has been shown that uh, if you give oxygen at birth the mortality is high so they were, therefore in term baby you must uh, recitate with normal layer that means 21 percent of oxygen but what about the preterm babies so still it is um, you know it is debatable how much oxygen needed to recitate a preterm baby uh, however, the routine use of oxygen, 100% oxygen is no longer uh, recommended in preterm babies also. Uh, the recommended uh, the amount is around like 30 to 40%. Even if you like uh, uh, state a baby with air, that is also not good for the preterm babies. Whereas term babies, yes, preterm babies, not good. Then you, you need to start with around 30 to 40%. So the problem is how would you give 30 to 40% oxygen, right? So in, look at yeah, if you look at your neonatal units and the delivery rooms, um, either you can provide 21% of oxygen or else 100% of oxygen. So therefore, you can't give 30% or 40% of oxygen. However, in other countries, uh, there's a gadget called air oxygen blenders, right? So uh, with this uh, gadget, actually, you can regulate the amount of oxygen that you are going to use in newborn babies. Um, especially the preterm babies, right? This is the gadget I was talking about. The, so the recommendation to practice for the preterm babies, that means less than 22 weeks, start with blended oxygen and AR and titrate FI2 guided by the pulse oximetry. That's why we ask you to uh, place the pulse oximetry immediately after birth. That means within one minute of birth, we need to place the um, pulse oximeter in right hand. That is, we need to check the preductal saturation. Based on this preductal saturation, so you need to titrate oxygen. However, if your unit hasn't got uh, blend um, blend oxygen blender, then of course you need to start with what is available. Most of the time, we start with 100%. We know that is not good. So our aim is to get down these oxygen regulators. So this is the uh, the chart that we use. Uh, I told you at one minute, uh, the targeted preductal saturation is like 60 to 65 whereas at 10 minutes it should be uh, 85 to 95 uh, for example uh, after five minutes if your baby's saturation is like still 70 or something then of course better to give a little bit of oxygen right rather than giving 100 percent of oxygen so 
how to connect pulse ox. Sometimes you find it difficult to connect a pulse oximeter to the baby, but it's quite easy. The sensor, first, the sensor must be placed on the right hand or the wrist. And it should be placed on the, on the baby before connecting to the instrument. Most of the time, what we do is we switch on the monitor and then subsequently place the um, sensor, I mean, uh, pulse uh, sensor in the right hand. But that is not uh, very correct because it takes time to get a proper trace. Uh, you can reliable you can reliably you can get a kind of proper trace within 90 seconds if you place the uh, sensor before you start uh, switch on the monitor right uh, the other advantage is you can check the heart rate as well so um, i talked about uh, the amount of oxygen that you need to give and also i told you that inappropriate peep during recitation is also cause, I mean, it can cause problems so therefore so you you have to have some idea about how to titrate peep you know at birth lungs are filled with fluids so giving oxygen immediately after birth will not improve oxygenation first you need to remove these fluids from the lungs so therefore the opening of the alveoli that is called uh, uh, functional establishment of functional residual capacity is very very important so in preterm babies, you can easily, I mean, this, this thing you can easily done with the PEEP or the CPAP. So that's, that's why the delivery room CPAP is very, very important in preterm survival. So these are the benefits of early application of PEEP at delivery room. Um, it will increase lung aeration and it will stabilize alveoli and also the oxygenations will improve, improve the oxygenation. So... If you look at this picture, you, you know, you can compare with, you know, how to blow up a balloon, right? So when you blow up a balloon, at the beginning, you find it difficult to blow it up, right? So you need to blow it hard, right? Otherwise, it, it will never blow up like this. After some time, it is very easy to, you know, inflate the balloons after some time. So that is called the opening pressure. So your preterm baby's lungs behave like exactly like a balloon right so at the, at the beginning it's very difficult to inflate these lungs but if you can apply a peep or the functional established functional residual capacity in terms of peep applying peep you will find it very easy to inflate the lungs after that so that's why the peep is very important so um the coin trial investigators um, um you know uh, and uh, in their study, it has been shown that delivery room CPAP reduces the need for uh, mechanical ventilation and surfactant treatment. So if you can apply CPAP at delivery room, probably you don't need to even give surfactant sometime, right? So the earlier the CPAP is better the outcome, right? So how do you provide delivery room CPAP? That is the question, right? Have you got a CPAP machine at delivery room? No. So we have another gadget that is called Neopuff device. Devices that can provide this, such as Neopuff infant station, are recommended even in other countries. This is the gadget that we, they use to provide delivery room CPAP, not the CPAP machine. Right? So I think you are familiar with this um, equipment. This is called Neopuff. Rather than using a bag, um, this is the equipment you have to have in your neonatal unit and so less in delivery rooms. So the advantage is this you go to this slide i will tell you there are three categories of alveoli here the first category is uh, stable alveoli the second category is um, uh, unstable uh, alveoli where the third category is unventilated alveoli you know look at this alveoli how it behaves during the inspiration and expiration so the first category so you have already applied a peep that is the functional residual capacity so with that this uh, in alveoli inflate quite easily and then you know they are pretty much stable uh, the gas exchange take place without any problem whereas the second um, category you can see you know it's like when you're like um, you know restating a baby with using an ambu bag what happens when you use ambu bag so at the beginning it's very difficult to inflate these lungs before because you have not applied a peep you cannot apply peep with ambu bag right so therefore it's very difficult to inflate you need to give a higher pressure 
if you give a higher pressure, what would happen? So sometimes alveoli get boosted, right? So, so that is called the re-recruitment and de-recruitment injury. That means when you give a pressure, it over -distend. When you remove this pressure, it de-recruit, right? That is not good. Where, whereas if you use Neopuff at this stage, I mean, you can apply people also, therefore, um, you can nicely ventilate a baby using a Neopuff rather than amber bag. So um, the other thing is, you know that uh, high tidal oil. So that is the number one contributing factors for the ventilator induced lung injury. So therefore, you should avoid this excessive tidal volume. If you use, as I told you earlier, ambu bag, you give a higher pressure, higher volume actually, right? So however, if you can titrate your pressure with Neopuff, then the damage uh, which is caused by tidal volume would be minimum, right? So how to minimize this excessive tidal volume? So when you use Neopuff equipment, uh, set the peep around PIP, that is peak inspiratory pressure around 20 to 25 water centimeter. And when you are given inflation breath and use the minimum pressure when giving ventilation breaths also. That means look at the ba your baby's chest movement and the chest is nicely moving. Then of course you can further, further cut down the pressure that is required to inflate the lungs. If the baby is spontaneous breathing, avoid unnecessary ventilation breath. You know, when the baby is breathing, you don't need to give ventilation breath. Just apply the P pressure and bring the baby on the stabilized baby. Avoid bag and mask ventilation, as I mentioned, uh, because of the previous reasons, right? And also, once you uh, sometimes preterm babies, after giving PEEP and ventilation breath and all that, sometimes you may have to intubate these babies because if, if you can't manage with Neopuff, then, then and there you need to intubate the baby. When you intubate the baby, make sure the placement of the tube and also the lip levels, uh, lip level of the tube is so important, right? So when you are intubating a baby, you are, you are a bit, bit anxious and uh, the common mistake is uh, you forget about lip level. Sometimes in a preterm baby, say for example, one kilo baby, the lip level ideally should be like seven centimeters, where, whereas if you're anxious, sometimes you sit, the lip level is around like nine. That means one lung is ventilated, the other lung is not ventilated. That means you damage, you damage the lung, right? Both lungs probably, right? So therefore make sure when you intubate a baby, um, uh, there are kind of equation for that. That is six plus uh, body weight, uh, that is equal to the centimeter lip, right? Say for example, two kilo baby, uh, the lip level should be eight, right? One kilo baby, lip level should be seven like that. So use of the lowest PIP that result in adequate ventilation. So what about the giving surfactants? Some people used to, some uh, doctors used to give surfactant at delivery room, but it is not recommended nowadays. So you need to use surfactant uh, selectively. That means selective early prophylactic uh, treatment would be the ideal uh, strategy for preterm newborn babies, not the um, prophylactic uh, surfactant treatment at the room itself, right? And also, I told you that uh, hypothermia is the number one killer, right? Most of the units. So uh, you need to take precautions to avoid hypothermia. This during it happens quite frequently during restations and during the transport of this baby, and also while at NICU. Sometimes we see that in babies in the NICU, in the incubators, still they are hypothermic, right? Always make sure babies are not hypothermic. So, um, uh, or if the baby's on admission temperature is like um, less than 32, at on admission temperature, it's moderate, it's almost 80%. Uh, so these are the complications of hypothermia. I don't need to read this out, right? These are uh, pretty common, uh, I'm sure that you must be knowing these things, right? So, when I was in Goal, um, we did a study, I mean, uh, audit actually. So, almost 63% of the babies who are admitted to the neonatal, neonatal intensive care unit was hypothermic. Right? So, um, this is a common problem 
in this country, right? So you need to make precautions to avoid this problem. Why these babies are more prone to develop hypothermia? Because as you all know, their surface area is large and decreased thermal insulation due to lack of subcutaneous fat and also the reduced amount of um, brown fat. These are, the, uh, these are the factors which can contribute to hypothermia. And this is the mechanism of heat loss. I'm not going to discuss about these things um, for your information. So with this background, so we thought actually, it is recommended in most of the studies, use of plastic bags in preterm delivery. If your baby is less than 28 egg weeks of gestation, it's better to use plastic bags for the preterm delivery. It should be uh, completely covered after, the, after they are next in a food grade plastic, normal bags that is available in supermarkets probably that is enough it shouldn't be you don't need to like have some sterile bags right it's normal bag would be enough right so in that case you don't need to dry the baby you just deliver into the baby into the plastic bag immediately after birth and once you cover the baby with plastic bag put a hat on the hair a hat on the head head and also you need to keep the baby under radiant former uh, they should remain wrapped until their temperature has been checked after admission. What happens is common mistake, you know that once the baby is admitted to the neonatal unit, you just remove the plastic bag, right, without even checking the temperature. That is not good. You need to make sure the baby's temperature is normal. If the temperature is normal only, you can take the plastic bag off. Um, at the same time, uh, you need to maintain delivery room temperature around 26. If you can switch off the AC, that would be really good. Sometimes it's very difficult, right? Central laces, you, do, you can't switch off the ACs, right? So this is how you should use the plastic bags, right? Um, yeah, you have like uh, cover the baby up to the neck and then using this new puff, you ventilate, you can see uh, baby is connected to the pulse oximeter as well. Saturation is 39, heart rate, you can see 78. That's not good anyway. Um, sometimes we have seen in the doctors and the nurses, they find it difficult to use this plastic bag thing, right? But quite, this is quite easy. What you need to do is invert the bag over one's hand and gently hold the feet and re-invert the bag over the body, over the baby. Prabodhan is expert, I think, doing this. Right? <laughs> so, resuscitation in the delivery room, right? Um, so this is a brief, uh, um, you know, outline about uh, how do you restate a baby in the delivery room. Deliver the baby into a plastic bag, as I mentioned earlier, without drying and drying with towels. Place the baby under the radiant warmer and cover the head with a hat and you assess the situation, right? Color, tone, breathing, heart rate. But here the color, you don't need to check the color because your saturation uh, pulse oximeter is there. And heart rate is also, you don't need to... Um, check with a stethoscope, but it is there in the pulse oximeter, right? And torn and breathe in only you need to assess, right? So this is the normal like term baby. Uh, only difference is um, you just deliver the baby into a plastic bag, that's all. And also the pulse oximeter. If baby is spontaneously breathing, you just apply PEEP or the nasal CPAP at delirium, that's all. You don't need to do anything, right? And you then connect the baby into a plastic, uh, sorry, pulse oximeter and check SpO2 and adjust the FiO2 accordingly. And avoid hypothermia, assess breathing and circulation. Once the baby is stabilized, you can transfer the baby with PEEP or the CPAP. This is also essential. When you transfer, also make sure that you are applying the same pressure. Otherwise, the alveoli get collapsed, tend to collapse, right? If baby is not breathing, what you're supposed to do? Then follow the, no the newborn life support normal protocol. And if it fails, you may have to intubate the baby with the appropriate size CT tube and uh, make sure the lip level is correct. And confirm the ET position uh, clinically. Uh, but in some countries, what they do is use an ultrasound scan. They confirm the position of the ET tube, but we don't have that facility. Uh, but if it is possible, if you have got that facility, please use that. And secure the ET. This is also important. Sometimes, you know, without securing the ET, you transfer the baby to the NHU. On your journey, cube is out, right? And properly, you need to secure the ET tube. Adjust the set um, 
just to set PIP and PEEP in F5 to accordingly, avoid hyperoxia and excessive tidal volume. Right, I'm going to skip this and the, the further measures. Then once you intubate and ventilate, reassess breathing and circulation again and again, quite frequently and avoid, uh, make sure the baby is not hypothermic and communicate with teams without informing the team, maybe informing your uh, colleagues don't send the baby to the neonatal intensive care unit. Make sure the, everything is ready before you transfer, right? If the baby is unstable, you can't transfer. You have to restate further in the delivery room itself. And then once the baby is stabilized on the stable only, you need to transfer the baby. You can transfer the baby. So arrange trace, uh, sorry, safe trans to NSU after initial safe stabilization. And also, don't ever forget to, I mean, this is a legal document, so you need to document properly the sequence of events, right? So what about the delayed cord clamping and placental infusion in preterm babies, right? Um, uh, earlier, sometime back, it was a common practice, once the baby is born, you cut the cord and, you know, hand over the baby to neonatal team. But there are new evidence, not new actually, not very new. Um, it shows that if you delay the cord clamp, delay the clamping of cord, there are numerous benefits for the pre especially for the preterm babies. So I would like to highlight what are the benefits if you can delay the uh, cord clamping in newborn babies. These are the potential benefits of placental transition or delayed cord clamping. That means that means uh, if you can delay the uh, cord clamping. Uh, you could probably reduce blood transfusion, um, reduction in blood transfusion, and respiratory distress syndrome, anemia of prematurity, intraventricular hemorrhage, they're very significant that, and also the late onset sepsis, floating abnormalities, and periventricular leukomalacia. These are the potential benefits of um, promoting placental transfusion or the delayed coat clamping. Um, so this is a summary of evidence in Cochrane data, uh, Cochrane uh, reviews, and it clearly shows that lesser need for transfusion, uh, blood transfusion, and better circular stability, and less intraventricular hemorrhage. That means all grades, including grade four, right? And lower risk for necrotizing enterocolitis. So therefore, as much as possible, please um, arrange this, or like uh, advise your obstetric colleague to delay the cord before you cut, um, before you uh, restate the baby. And this is the recommendations to practice. For uncompromised babies, a delay in cord clamping of at least one minute from the complete delivery of the infant is recommended. For babies requiring recitation, recitative intervention remains the priority. However, if a baby is bad, then you may, you may have to take the baby to the recitate quickly. In summary, in my lecture, so the, in, when it comes to the management of preterm baby, the preparation is very, very important. Uh, and avoid hyperoxia, inappropriate beep, excessive tidal volume, and hyperthermia, which is very detrimental to the preterm lungs. Um, as you all know, the earlier the CPAP, the better the outcome. And the Neopuff can be used to provide beep at delivery room uh, rather than just starting nasal prone oxygen. So the delayed cord clamping seems to have uh, beneficial effects on preterm babies. Thank you, Dr. Nali, uh, for that. Uh with elaborative uh, practical aspect of uh, management of uh, preterm, immediate management of the preterm. Now the next session would be a case-based discussion uh, by Dr. Suranta Pereira. Uh, he is a consultant pediatrician at the Castle Street Hospital for Women. Uh, he will be talking uh, on overcoming challenges with preterm. Okay, uh, good evening to everybody and uh, Professor Indika, President of SLMA, and Dr. Kaushalya, President of the uh, Society, and uh, uh, my dear colleagues. I'm thankful for all of you uh, being here and the uh, people at the head table for organizing this event. Uh, so this is a new experience for us to talk to you uh, like this in C-19 pandemic threat. Uh, so, uh, I think uh, I'm thankful to my previous two speakers. They made my life easy. So what we are thinking now is, uh, can we discuss a patient and see uh, how challenging 
managing a preterm. So uh, when we talk about preterm uh, babies, the prematurity, what is prematurity? I think all of you know uh, this classification, but things have changed a little bit. Uh, I want you to focus on gestational age. It says late preterm, moderate preterm, and very preterm. Certain things have changed a little bit, and uh, this type of uh, division is very useful when we gather data and analyze, and uh, these cohorts, the, their issues slightly varied. I'm going to talk about a baby born to a 20-year-old primary mother with a history of gestational diabetes mellitus and uh, had premature rupture of membrane for three days and associated with chorioamnionitis. Chorioamnionitis would have been the precipitant factor, a precipitant factor for this uh, early delivery. And this baby was born at 27 plus three weeks with a weight of around one kilo. If you look at the problems, and uh, quite a number, this is what we encounter even when we look at our diagnosis card uh, of one of these babies, and it carries a long list. And starting from extreme prematurity, born at 27 plus 3, now 34 plus 4 weeks, with a weight of uh, 170 at the birth, and now uh, 1310. Initially had surfactant deficiency lung disease, we have given a single dose of uh, surfactant, which, which was given at 90 minutes. When we look at the ventilator pattern, initially was on SIMV for five days, briefly was on NIPP for 24 hours at the end of five days, but we had to revert back to uh, SIMV again, which we continued till 22 days, up to 22 days age. And then we changed to NIPP, we and continued for another three days, and then Change to CPAP again, but you know uh, the the nosocomial infection are very challenging proposition for them, and then we had to reintubate it at day 35. We continued that up to 44 days, and we not to CPAP following ligation of the PDA, patent doctor's arteriotis, and uh, had pneumothorax on day 14, needle aspiration done, and then we kept the tube for five days and took it out. When we talked about neonatal sepsis and ventilator-associated pneumonia, we did a septic screen and started on antibiotics. And all of us know we start with CEPIN and gentamicin and cefotaxime, but unusual from the West is we had to move for some of the high-end antibiotics uh, like vancomycin, salbactam, and cholestin. Little alarming, uh, I like to draw at your attention to this point. ET secretion culture was positive for acinetobacter on day 8, and it was sensitive for salbactam only. Again on day 38, acinetobacter became positive because we wanted to send for PDA ligation, and we had to do this test, uh, including MRSA. It was negative for MRSA, but positive for acinetobacter. Uh, and uh, to be honest, uh, most of the days when the baby was in the NICU was on antibiotics, I cannot note a period which the baby was not on. Immunoglobulin, we have given two courses, and uh, we suspected necrotizing enterocolitis and feeds her with help. We did not see classic picture in the X-ray and some other uh, features, but uh, we managed with ongoing antibiotics. Had neonatal conventions on day two and day three. And again on day 22, but uh, it did not continue. We were able to manage with IV phenobarbital and ultrasound scan brain was normal. Anemia we managed with Paxels, they're given on day 3, 10, 11, and 30, 17, 31, 36. And we had a large PDA, we detected on day 5 with a, a wide pulse pressure. Attempted closure with two cycles of oral paracetamol, we either use ibuprofen or paracetamol, and, uh, but at the end, we had to go for uh, ligation under the GA, general anesthesia. Uh, bronchopulmonary dysplasia was managed, managed with hydrochlorothiazide as spinalactone, and uh, we felt like spinalactone would help managing the uh, PD also. 
uh, till the surgery is being done. Uh, retinopathy of prematurity no, uh, shown to stage uh, shown to with stage two and plus disease, uh, and the recommendation was to give avastin, and uh, uh, it was scheduled to be given today. Uh, this is the baby, and you can see the uh, goes uh, covering the goes up covering the uh, thoracic uh, scar uh, following pre ligation. So what I thought is uh, rather than talking about uh, uh, one after the other, with a, we can select some uh, corners, uh, some topics and then uh, have a small uh, uh, idea about it. And uh, indication for surfactant. All of us know some of the indication, but I want to replenish your knowledge. And all infants uh, less than 28 weeks, yes, we give uh, surfactant. But early rescue, uh, we give for not to, uh, up to two hours. And then for all neonates uh, more than 28 weeks who require ventilation, beyond initial resuscitation we give. Uh, and uh, then uh, when the in infants uh, hangs on to uh, higher oxygen, especially more than 0.3, uh, and uh, then at this point we consider that. And then we have to give sometimes top ups when the baby is large also. Because the, when the baby is large, the surface area of the lung also the, is bigger. And the rescue treatment within the first 24 hours we can consider uh, retreatment, especially uh, when the oxygen requirement is high, either 40 percent, or if it is high, more than 30 percent with uh, significant chest X-ray changes. Third dose may be beneficial in some patients and should be uh, uh, consultant. This is what I mean. A senior person should decide about it. There is a place uh, when there is a secondary surfactant failure in meconium aspiration and pulmonary hemorrhage and severe pneumonia. Uh, types of surfactant. When we look at the types of surfactant, there are two groups, natural and synthetic surfactants. Uh, Comparative tri trials have demonstrated the improvement in the, uh, when we give natural surfactant is uh, much more better. Uh, fever pneumothoracis has been noted and fever death. And uh, although it increased the chances of uh, necrotized enterocolitis, uh, there can be pulmonary hemorrhage and as well as intraventricular hemorrhages, but it doesn't escalate uh, these uh, things uh, from uh, to get uh, give rise to worse results. And commonly we use uh, three natural surfactants. Uh, we can't uh, find one, uh, we can't say one, no, uh, one is better over the other. And uh, there is no clinically significant differences among them. And uh, what I want to tell something is uh, earlier, uh, people tried to produce synthetic surfactants. Uh, some were failed and taken out of the market. But currently, there are a few good ones uh, at the research level. And then there are some publications. Because uh, as all of us know, they have isolated the uh, gene, uh, the, the genomic area, which produce surfactant. It's a matter of giving it to a microorganism like bacteria and producing it and the pneumothorax is a, one of the problems uh, which we can see in this baby so in, uh, we noted in our uh, small one and then it can be primary or secondary what i want to highlight here is people should pay attention to uh, rapidly rising oxygen requirement and hypercapnia sometimes when we ask when they contact us from uh, for 30 to 40 percent, they have gone up to 900 when they give a call in the middle of the night. So, uh, this area people have to uh, pay an attention and uh, they have to remember dope. And when they, they are issues that is dislodged tube, obstructed tube, pneumothorax, and equipment failure. And all of us know how to put a tube. So, I thought of uh, talking something different uh, problems and troubleshooting. So, if baby does not improve after putting the tube, uh, intercostal tube, check the position of the drain and readjust it. And then, not only that, when there is a pneumothorax, there is a 25% of chance to ha have it bilaterally. So check the other side. And uh, if there is a large leak, you may have to put another second drain. 
and correct, which is correctable, uh, like comorbidities, acidosis, persistent pulmonary hypertension, and systemic hypertension. Look for pre and post doctor uh, saturations. These were the uh, I, I extracted from when I look at some of the uh, Oxford guidelines. Then when we talk about the neonatal sepsis, uh, which uh, my uh, this uh, newborn uh, extreme platum also had, Acinetobacter is at the forefront. It produces a very challenging environment for us uh, in our clinical setting. Very difficult to get rid of it. It's a robust very, uh, organism. And it's a gram-negative cocobacillus. Uh, it belongs to the escape organism, which comprises of Acinetobacter, Enterococcus, Enterococcus, Taphorius, Clostridium difficile, Pseudomonas, Eruginus, and Enterobacterus. And even World Bank, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the WHO has prioritized uh, as a, and recognized Acinetobacter as a, one of the microorganisms where we should uh, research and try to produce uh, new uh, medications. When we talk about Acinetobacter uh, resistance, you can see uh, they produce the beta lactamases and neutralize Kepulosporinases uh, uh, by producing Kepulosporinases. And it reduces expression of porin canals. So the entry of the drug into the uh, bacteria is uh, prevented. Then overexpression of bacterial efflux pumps. And uh, so again, it uh, helps to them to develop resistance. And not only that, they have mutations. Uh, and uh, it helps them to uh, resist quinolones and cholesterol. What, is, what I want to show is, by these mechanisms, this is a very clever bacteria. It has acquired uh, ways of uh, developing resistance and improving survival chance. When we, another point I want to discuss is uh, when we select antibiotic therapy, it's very uh, challenging. Uh, we should know local susceptibility in our unit. Usually, it is only sensitive to sulbactam and cholestin. And uh, when we select antibiotics, uh, better to go for a once we have the culture and the sensitivity pattern, better to go for narrow antibiotic uh, like sulbactam. Otherwise, we have to, we can start uh, empirically, and we can select fluor fluoroquinolone, aminoglycoside. Or cholesterol with the other second options, and uh, then the carbon penems are useful when they resist actually uh, beta lactams. Uh, moving to uh, another uh, domain that is pathogenesis of ventilator associated pneumonia, and uh, these are the points which will help uh, these bacteria to survive and then develop uh, web. So the uh, caretaker's hands, fingernails, using stethoscope, those are very important. When we talk about the attachment, ventilatory circuits, humidifiers, uh, nasopharyngeal, uh, oropharyngeal tubes, and uh, tracheal secretions, those are very important. Not only that, we always forget uh, gastric fluid pooling in the um, nasogastric tubes and orogastric tubes. So those are very important. So the list devices we use, less uh, tubes, less attachment, uh, and uh, if, we, if we can manage babies on uh, CPAP and NIPPV, less chances of uh, ventilation associated pneumonia. And there's a web bundle, but, but I want to highlight this. This is the latest what we have. And uh, the key area they concentrate on intubation process and the compliance and respiratory equipment we use and suctioning and how frequently we do uh, head uh, head uh, elevation of the head, uh, head dent, and uh, mouth tear, as well as uh, assessment for intubation. When it comes to mouth tear, uh, we can use uh, breast milk, and uh, most of the nurses they do it. So, um, the, the, the doctors who work in NISOs should pay uh, or should adhere to proper hand washing, as well as minimizing contact with the baby. And when they go in, uh, they must uh, identify the need and uh, should not do it frequently. And then the must uh, use these tubes uh, when necessary only. Moving to another uh, area is uh, 
our baby also has the bronchopulmonary dysplasia. When we look at a different, different definition with the time it evolves, but there's a common thing uh, in all these definitions, a common statement that is oxygen requirement either 28 postnatal days or 36 weeks of postmenstrual age. So we started uh, this baby on hydrochlorothiazide, and then the, I put on, uh, started on spinal lactone uh, to balance the outcomes of the uh, PD as well as the BP, bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Uh, so the, uh, for the thiazide, uh, we use chlorothiazide and hydrochlorothiazide, uh, but study shows is not to uh, use uh, in combination of spinal electron, which we have done. Uh, the other question is when we start, when to stop? And uh, the stopping point is when the baby is uh, no longer receiving positive airway pressure and have a fraction of in inspired oxygen less than 30%. And the uh, other question is uh, when to do the electrolytes. Uh, we had to do initially first uh, day or two and later at least weekly. And uh, Bruce might, uh, we use uh, uh, rarely, uncommonly, but it can be used especially when there's acute flooding of the uh, uh, lungs, pulmonary demise, when pulmonary demise is noted. Uh, and also, when we give transfusion, there's a place for frosmite. Uh, you must know the side effect of frosmite. It uh, promotes uh, uh, excretion of electrolytes, calcium, and then a uh, lot of calcium means problems for kidneys, especially nephrocalcinosis. And when we talk about steroids, Steroids, all of us know currently, we are a little bit uh, careful using it uh, because uh, the effects on the nervous system and the long-term outcomes. Uh, dexamethasone is the preferred one we use uh, on a taper induce. Uh, and uh, it is now a little bit reserved for severe BPD, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, especially when the oxygen requirement remains a little bit higher, more than 50%. I have used uh, immunoglobulin. Now, argument is, uh, I have seen time time people use it uh, because uh, neonates are at high risk of infection due to incompetence and uh, maternal transport immunoglobin happens uh, uh, after 32 weeks of gestation and endogenous synthesis is delayed usually in newborns. So administration of intravenous immunoglobin, we, provide, uh, we try to provide, uh, uh, improve the immunity by uh, improving the opsonic activity, activating the complement pathway and uh, promoting antibody dependent cytotoxicity and uh, improving neutrophilic chemoluminescence. Uh, theoretically, infections, morbid uh, morbidity and mortality should be reduced. But what the research says, research say they do not uh, uh, recommend it because uh, findings doesn't support it. Uh, now, the one point you must uh, keep an eye on is we use guidelines. Now, from the guideline, again, people are moving towards patient-specific management, patient group-specific group management. Uh, even, uh, now, it has started from uh, cancer therapy. Now, it's coming into other disciplines also. So, the uh, question is whether we can generalize guidelines to a specific baby. And uh, uh, if somebody the, the, uh, do not give, that is fine. Uh, but uh, whatever you do, you must uh, rationalize it. When we finally, this baby had a series of x-rays. X-rays are good to diagnose congenital as, as well as acquired defects. And uh, uh, sometimes uh, respiratory symptoms are very non-specific. X-ray provide a better yield. And uh, what you have to remember is uh, always the, what we find in x-ray doesn't tally the clinical uh, symptoms also. And uh, this is the baby. This photograph was taken today. Uh, so baby has been now uh, stabilized on uh, nasal prong oxygen. So uh, what I try to uh, highlight was some selected areas rather than trying to talk about all the problems uh, this baby has faced. So when I look at the x-rays which were taken, uh, this baby had a series of x-rays. So uh, nice to go through it uh, very quickly. Uh, so how the lungs, uh, the pathology of the lungs are reflected. Okay. So this is the first X-ray. Can be seen. Huh? Okay. So the, give me two three minutes, and this is the initial X-ray. 
and move into the second one, you can see gradually ground glass appearances uh, uh, appear, uh, appearing and then the uh, bronchovascular markings are prominent. And uh, you can nicely see in the previous. So this is the, this is the point uh, earlier we gave the surfactant, one dose was sufficient. And uh, I don't like this uh, NG tube most of the time sometimes get kinked inside. I always uh, ask nurses to measure and put it in. Now, this is the point where the pneumothorax uh, has uh, been developed and then the, it increases in size and uh, we have used the needle thoracocentesis and uh, then uh, here you can see it's further increasing at this point uh, yeah, uh, we have put the uh, NG, sorry, uh, intercostal tube right? and then uh, it has been dissolved can see the plaster and then again and a small pneumothorax developed we use a needle thorax synthesis and it responded I, I did not try to convert it to again another uh, insertion of intercostal tubes and uh, here uh, you can see the lungs are much better but you can see the uh, bronco early set setting of bronchopalmary dysplasia this is the uh, ligation of the PDA the clip and again uh, now you can see the lungs are improving much more better so just to show how the lung pathophysiology pathology evolved in X-ray uh, with uh, our interventions, and uh, with that note, uh, so uh, I think we try to uh, capture the essence of uh, uh, studying this uh, uh, management of uh, newborn, uh, uh, the preterm, uh, by asking the proboscidean to highlight the uh, prevention of the. Uh, preterm delivery and nothing to discuss about uh, initial management and for me to use a case to highlight how complicated things are how patiently we have to wait for a longer period to achieve the uh, best outcome thank you very much thank you dr suranta for that informative uh, case based discussion uh, we are now coming to the end of the session uh, we can give one or two minutes if there are any clarifications or questions from the audience. Since absence of any questions from the audience, uh, I would like to invite Professor Indik Karnat to uh, conclude the session. Thank you. With that, we come to the end of this uh, very useful and informative joint clinical meeting conducted uh, with the SLMA in collaboration with the Perinatal Society of Sri Lanka. And I thank all the resource persons uh, who have discussed and provided very valuable information about regarding the management of newborn. And uh, also, uh, I must thank the Perinatal Society, especially Dr. Suranta Pera, for organizing this activity uh, in a very during a very difficult time period. And also, uh, special thanks must, must go to the technical team, SLMA team, because you may be noticed that this is the first meeting that we are conducting after we have converted the SLMA auditorium into the, the new technology with the distance learning facility. So there may be some teething problems that we have gone through. So I thank uh, the technical team, especially for their very dedicated work uh, with the challenging circumstances, especially Dr. Pramod and Dr. Sajid and uh, Mr. Joseph, all of you for their support. And uh, last but not least, the audience who have joined us both online as well as in person. And all this material will be available online in our SLMA platforms, the YouTube as well as social media. And uh, later, Dr. Suranta will be compiling all the material that has come up from the clinical meetings into a series of uh, informative guidelines that will come a little later. So before finishing, I would like to express the gratitude of SLMA for all the resource persons. And I invite the on stage all the three resource persons, Dr. Prabodhana, Dr. Narin Gamatike, and Dr. Suranta to show the appreciation of SLMA for the resource persons. Thank you, and uh, with that, we come to the end of the clinical meeting. Have a nice day. <laughs>